we have we have our uh, wrap up talk today to kind of pull everything together. We've had a lot of information, and um, we want to think about systems and, and pulling all these different tactics together, and how do we do it? So we have Dr. Adam Davis from the University of Illinois. He's the department chair of the, uh, the Department of Crop Sciences. He earned his PhD at Iowa State University. That's where I got my master's degree in entomology. And uh, he's internationally known as a scholar of agroecology with an emphasis on ecological weed management. His research takes use of both experimental and modeling approaches to solve applied weed ecology problems in field crop development. Currently, he is modeling the evolution and spread of herbicide resistant weeds, developing multi tactic integrated weed management systems for organic loads for external farms, predicting changing distributions of weed and invasive plants under global change. So, with that, Adam, I'm going to let you take it away. Great. Thanks very much, Aaron. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, the sound is great. Thanks very much. So yeah, as Aaron said, I'm going to be talking about um, some of the considerations, kind of systems level considerations that you might think about addressing as you're trying to design weed suppressive cropping systems. So I'll start with this figure from an article that George Frisvold, uh, ag economist, and I put out a few years back. Um, this figure shows pesticide productivity index, including herbicides, insecticides, and fungicides over time. And you can see that since the mid 80s, we've had a downward slope. And that should be concerning to anybody who's a weed manager. Um, that is the signature of herbicide resistance. And um, in that same article, we were looking at the relationship between uh, resistance events over time. These are different modes of action, these different lines. You can see these different modes of action, number of resistance events going up. And at the same time, with the exception of one um, chemical, one compound, everything is either flat or going down in terms of herbicide price. Um, so, the cost of resistance is actually not getting factored into products, which we should all be concerned about because there's no incentive for people to use them carefully. Um, and you can see that, in fact, the technology price uh, that people pay has been going up with the number of normalized resistance events, even though you're losing that feature that you're paying for. So how can we design weeds Impressive cropping systems that do more of the work and don't make the herbicide do all the work. So I'll talk about a few main things in this presentation. I'll start with the idea that weed management is managing evolution. I'll include some lessons that we learned uh, through on-farm studies as well as some empirical studies and then think a little bit more explicitly about uh, integrated weed management and cropping system design. So the raw materials of evolution are a heritable variable trait and selection pressure. So selection pressure is an environmental condition that affects the fitness value or number of offspring related to a trait. And you can have Continuous variation, as in this example, this is poa species that is increasing in height continuously. Or you can have discontinuous variation where you've got two contrasting categorical types of a variables. So and here we've got two different seed types of beggar tick. And that long skinny one and that short thick one are these two morphs of the seed, discontinuous variation. When a strong selection pressure is applied consistently, nature evolves rapidly away. 
So let's say we're thinking about a trait value like height, and we provide some kind of selection on the extreme end of that distribution for that trait. That trait begins to move away after multiple selection events. And in fact, you can see this with yellow foxtail, which has continuous variation for height. And if you mow enough times, you'll get populations that will consistently go to seed at one inch tall and create a sward of reproductive plants like this. In the same way, when you apply an herbicide multiple years in a row, you can get resistance. And so this was in 1996, uh, looking from one of my field sites. And in 2005, in Illinois, in uh, Fayette County, we had our first population of resi glyphosate-resistant water hemp within a soybean crop. And in this case, we all know that in 1996, Roundup Ready soybeans were released. Market penetration happened very quickly. And because it was so easy to use, we were near 100% adoption by 2000. And it was only a matter of time before that intensive selection drove us to a point where we had resistant populations. Our primary, our dominant weed of corn and soybeans right now is common water hemp, although uh, Palmer amaranth uh, is catching up. This kind of selection though doesn't just happen in chemically driven cropping systems. So here, this is a photo of uh, an organic dairy up near the Wisconsin border in Illinois. And this is supposed to be a soybean field here, but as you can see, it's a giant ragweed field. And the grower asked me to come take a look at that population and help her figure out what was going on. And I collected seeds from mature giant ragweed plants. And um, I went ahead and germinated them in the greenhouse. And this is what I found. I found that compared to unselected ag accessions, like those that grow along riverbanks in Illinois, the accession that we had on the organic farm had germination that extended all the way throughout the growing season up to late June. And what essentially this grower had done is through excessive reliance on early season cultivation, it had killed out that portion of the population and instead selected on this tail and now had a genotype that had essentially evolved resistance to steel to that cultivation method. And um, we had to come up with a different plan for a cropping system that could reduce their reliance on that single massive um, trait, the, the tool that they were using to kill ragweed. And this same process can happen regardless of the trait. There's all sorts of weed traits that you can select on if you push them too hard. And so um, you can select, for example, on the color of the petiole of a grass. Barnyard grass is a, a weed that infests rice throughout Southeast Asia. Hand weeding is a very common approach to getting rid of barnyard grass there. And yet the um, rice uh, the, the, had a red petiole they introduced in order to make the weeding more selective. Barnyard grass within a few years evolved a red petiole so that it would be skipped over in hand weeding efforts. Any of these traits, you push them too hard and you'll get resistance. So when you're thinking about cropping system design that might slow weed evolution to some of the tools you're using, my main principle is to try to create heterogeneous or changing environments. You need to mix it up. If you're a pitcher who only throws one pitch, you know that the batter is gonna figure it out and hit that pitch out of the park. And in the same way, you need to be able to have a whole toolbox of pitches that you can throw. So one of the things you wanna 
think about is potentially varying your selection pressures over time. And another approach, as we saw in the previous talk on physical tools for cultivation, you can combine selection pressures simultaneously to great advantage. So let's take a look at these two strategies just with respect to herbicide resistance. One resistance strategy to avoid resistance might be to rotate your modes of action over time. And so you're only applying a given herbicide you know, every four years. Um, if you've got a high fitness cost in your resistance trait, meaning that it's an expensive trait to for the plant to um, manifest and that if you're not applying that pressure, the trait will go away, you might see something like this where you apply that herbicide. When you don't apply that herbicide, that resistance allele might be too expensive for the plant to maintain. Then you come back and you select again. It enriches it in the population, you rotate away, goes down, enrich, goes away, enrich, et cetera. On the other hand, what if that trait has a low fitness cost? What if resistance to cultivation doesn't cost that plant anything? Well, then when you apply the herbicide, instead of going away and decreasing in frequency, that resistance trait would just hang out in the population only to be enriched the next time you bring that tool back, stay there in the same state, enriched, and then enriched again. So you can see how you need to understand the trait uh, and how it affects fitness in order to begin planning strategies. Another possibility is that you might decide to apply multiple tools, in this case, multiple herbicides simultaneously through a tank mix, and you apply them year after year. Say you apply these three herbicides every year and you've got a resistance trait with a high mortality or fitness cost, you could potentially drive that trait out of the population over time, which would be great. On the other hand, what if you have a low mortality associated with that mix or a low fitness cost? You could end up selecting on multiple herbicide resistance and getting yourself into a great deal of trouble very quickly. So this is unfortunately the situation that we're facing right now in East Central Illinois. This weed right here is um, Amaranthus tuberculatus. This is uh, tall water hemp. And this is happily infesting a field of corn after receiving a 4x dose of 2,4-D. So it looks very cheerful. What else can you throw at me? This, at the time that this photo was taken in 2016, this population was resistant to five modes of action. In 2022, we added another one the long chain fatty acids. And the only resistance that this population doesn't have is the one that the neighbors has, which is glyphosate resistance. So it's only a matter of time before this population is beyond chemical control. We decided to go ahead and uh, recreate the resistances in that population in a common genetic background and study it, study the fitness cost of these um, different traits that there, there was resistance for in the population in these soil floored greenhouses. Chen Shi Wu did this work. There was only one trait, ALS resistance, for which there was any fitness cost. For the others, they either stayed the same or even went up over time in the absence of selection. So this bore out the idea that non-target site resistance is really important in this particular genotype. And in much of Illinois, we see the same thing with multiple herbicide resistance based on very low fitness costs. So we decided to take this out into farms. And we studied this um, factors that potentially affecting the evolution risk of herbicide on 141 farms. So visited each of these farms and um, 
took data on um, the uh, resistance frequency in mother plants over two year period. And we got from every single grower, 10 years of management history. So what were they doing in their cropping systems? What was their chemical program? What was their crop rotation? Were they using animal manures? Um, right, so here is their management history, cropping system, herbicide program, animals, what machinery they used. And then we also looked at landscape questions. So how near were infected fields to other infected fields? Was water potentially spreading stuff? Um, what was topography like? Were there barriers to gene flow? Um, what was land use history like and landscape complexity? So here's what some of the fields look like. These are fields that are more typical of what Illinois production looks like, where there's just a, not a whole lot of landscape variability. Although I will say that this hedgerow right here is atypical for us. We don't even have hedgerows anymore for the most part. Uh, here's a pocket field uh, that is surrounded by hedgerows. We theorized that maybe that would actually slow down gene flow. And then here's one where the matrix is actually forest, and then you've got a little carve out here within that. A lot of uh, ditches and drainage of water in this part of the landscape. And we took the seeds that we were collecting from each of these fields and we screened them through a high throughput uh, resistance screening protocol. And that enabled us to see for every single farm, what were the resistance levels amongst um, plants across that farm. So for 141 farms, many plants sampled from each farm, and then the management histories. And so we took those data and we asked the question, did herbicide rotation, which is a common management recommendation or, or was a common management recommendation for growers, help delay the onset of glyphosate resistance on those fields? And the answer was a resounding no, that as we began to look at more frequent turnover, the frequency of herbicide resistant individuals actually increased from you know, 0.04 to 10% of the population. And then the number of glyphosate applications per year increased it even further. So heavy glyphosate use was associated with greater resistance frequency and rotating herbicide modes of action over time was associated with more resistance frequency, giving you the insight that there was not a lot of fitness cost to glyphosate resistance in this population. Then we asked, did tank mixing, having one or, or two or more different modes of action in a tank mix help delay glyphosate resistance? And the answer to that was yes. So we saw a decrease um, in two different time points. Uh, both early in the management series and later in the management series, there was a negative association between the amount of resistant individuals in 2010 and 2011 um, to those earlier uh, applications. And as the number of uh, partners in the tank mix went up, the frequency went down. But you, know, you can see that it's not zero, it's just lower. And this is actually this approach using multiple tank mix partners is one that's common in fighting um, uh, uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria. Now, it's not a foolproof method and um, you have to be careful because you can end up with multiple drug resistant bacteria in the same way that you can end up with multiple herbicide resistant weeds. Another question that we asked is, are you doomed to have herbicide resistance if your neighbor is a lousy weed manager? Are you gonna get infected by them? And in fact, 
a really heartening result was that we did not see any signal of contagion among neighbors. That in fact, this signal of management complexity was much stronger than the signal of potentially infected neighbors. So that's a good thing because it means that what you do on your own farm matters. So from that on-farm work, we learned, first of all, that herbicide rotation doesn't help delay glyphosate resistance. It might work for other modes of action that have a fitness cost, and that in this case, the fitness cost of resistance to glyphosate was low. We also found that tank mixes or mode of action cocktails can help delay glyphosate resistance for a while, but they won't be perfect forever and they didn't get it to zero. A third lesson was that what you do on your field does matter and that you shouldn't necessarily go getting all of your weed managed, management advice off of a commercial or out of a jug, that you need to do some thinking on your own farm. And a final thing that we you know, saw with this study was that any weed management program relying only on herbicides is going to encounter resistance problems. So you have to diversify your practices. And so that's how this talk connects to what Aaron asked me to talk about today. Long-term solutions to managing weeds have to go beyond thinking about individual tactics the thinking at a system level. And so this meeting that you're at today, you know, is on integrated weed management. And you've been looking at these various tools, chemical, mechanical, cultural, and biological. And together, those tools make up integrated weed management. I want to mention that a really important basis or foundation for integrated weed management is prevention. Thinking about clean seed, certified seed, thinking about clean machinery. You know, the first Palmer amaranth plant that I saw in Illinois came in on an infected cultivator from Georgia. And if the person who had bought that cultivator had thought about just washing it in a gravel area before bringing it into the field, it would have been a different story. So some principles for weed management, or integrated weed management. First of all, it's not just a set of tools or tactics. It's really about understanding how to apply these tactics in concert for med maximum effect. And in order to do that, you need to know the weeds that you have on your farm. And I was glad to see that uh, the conference organizers uh, asked for a let list of weeds from you all. I think it's a really important first step to developing a practical and effective IWM plan. Once you know your weeds, then you choose tactics that are appropriate for a strategy to manage that weed community. Another important part of integrated weed management is thinking about how to spread the tactics that you use throughout the weed life cycle. It doesn't mean that you're going to kill a weed more, more than once, but if you begin approaching and um, targeting different stages in the weed life cycle, you've got a chance to reduce the population at multiple steps. Another important principle is to think about the long term. Don't just go ahead and manage your weeds in a single season, and then at the end of the season, let a bunch of weeds go to seed in your field. And then a final important consideration is how to build weed suppressive cropping systems. So some features of weed suppressive cropping systems. First of all, they prevent germination of seeds. They prevent seedling establishment. They reduce weed competition. And they reduce weed seed banks. And they do that through a number of different ways by reducing seed production, seed return, increasing seed predation, and increasing seed decay. 
So the first part about knowing your weeds is to know your weed life history. And by life history, I mean the stages that an individual plant goes through to complete its life cycle. So in this picture, this is a picture of velvet leaf here drawn by Sherry Earl, showing a seed bank to start with, a seed germinating, that germinated seed growing into a seedling, the seedling establishing as a juvenile, maturing to an adult plant, and then seed production and dispersal replenishing that seed bank. And that particular life history is called an annual life history. And in an annual life history, the most important target is that seed bank that's present throughout the year and that all individuals have to go through. So annuals are divided into summer annuals, which germinate in the spring, grow in the summer, reproduce in the fall, die in the winter with their seeds in the seed bank, and then repeating that cycle. Again, all individuals in the population have to go through that seed stage. The tall water hemp, the one that I showed you in that greenhouse study and on that field, is an example of a summer annual. On the other hand, a mare's tail is a good example of winter annual. A winter annual generally germinates early fall and winter, although now that winter is getting warmer and warmer, maybe it'll germinate even in January, who knows. Um, it germinates, it gets to a dormant state in winter, it produces seed in spring and early summer, and then dies in summer after reproduction. Biennials, on the other hand, complete their life cycle in two years. So here's an example of wild carrot or Daucus carota. It's a biennial. Um, so you get a germination often in the spring. It grows to produce a rosette that then remains dormant the following winter. The next spring, that rosette bolts and produces seed that plant dies and the seeds are in the seed bank and then the cycle begins again with germination in the following spring. So a two-year life cycle here, biennial. And then you've got perennials, which are basically like a biennial, except that the adult stage lives on and on. So you get germination, formation of a rosette, goes dormant, and then you've got an adult stage flowering, producing seeds, going dormant, and this goes on and on until the plant eventually dies. So one that I'm sure you're all familiar with is Canada thistle. And this is a species that produces very effectively uh, a lot of seeds, but also reproduces from very strong rhizomes that can get fragmented and dispersed through cultivation operations. The reason that it's so important to know your weed life history is that the primary targets differ depending upon the life history. So for annual weeds, the most important target to reduce population growth rate quickly is actually the seed. Of course, most of us end up targeting seedlings because that's the easiest part of the plant to target. So we use cultivation, we use herbicides, might use a biocontrol, might use flamers, but actually reducing seed production is where the most traction is. Biennials, the most important stages are actually the rosettes and seedlings, which are more important than the seeds. And that's because they can go on and on and produce more seeds. And then um, for perennials, rosettes are by far the most important then seedlings, then adults, then seeds. So for Canada thistle, targeting rosettes for destruction is actually the most important part of an integrated management plan. So one of the things you can do as you're thinking about planning your crop sequences within a crop rotation and a cropping system is how to disrupt life cycles with different types of crops. 
So for example, if you've got a situation where you have a summer annual weed that's your dominant weed and you just keep growing a summer annual crop, you've created a perfect environment for that summer annual weed to grow and reproduce year after year. And that is exactly what's happened in central Illinois is that people love to grow corn and soybean because they grow well here and they bring lots of money. But that predictable environment has basically narrowed the weed community to a point where you've got a perfectly adapted weed species that's taking that niche that you're creating with that summer annual crop and you're fertilizing it, protecting it, all that good stuff. And the weeds are just getting way too comfortable. What happens if you throw a winter annual crop into the equation where now you're planting in September or October, like with the winter wheat, and then you let it go over this winter, but instead of harvesting, you know, in September or October, like we do with corn and soybean here, you'd be harvesting in late June or early July. That disrupts that life cycle of that summer annual. So that management of the crop just by itself is now a tactic. Just that decision to change the growth period of the main crop is now acting as another tool in your toolbox. And so that's what I mean about planning a weed suppressive cropping system and understanding your weed community. Who's there in your weed community has everything to do with what you decide to do with your cropping system. Now, if you've got a perennial or a biennial crop, let's say you've got a forage legume in there, you're going to be taking multiple cuttings of that forage legume that can knock back perennial plants and biennial plants. It can also certainly disrupt annual life cycles, but a perennial crop like a forage legume can do a pretty nice job of providing some uh, a, a disruptive environment for that perennial weed. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's something I said earlier about targeting all stages of the weed life cycle. Um, the many little hammers concept is something that you've probably all heard of. Um, Matt Liebman and Eric Gallant popularized this in an article back in 1997. And the idea is that rather than putting everything into killing these above ground stages, you began thinking about how do we stop early germination? How do we target the seed bank? How do we stop seed return and spread these opportunities for managing weeds throughout the life cycle? This is a predecessor. This is an earlier integrated weed management guide that I wrote years ago before this excellent Moeller et al. integrated weed management guide, which I think is a much better a new replacement. But in this guide, I just wanted to point out that there is a section where I talk about how to spread these different strategies for weed management throughout the life cycle. So in, on the inside here, we've got the cycle of crop production. This is a summer annual weed and a spring planted crop. And then for each of these stages, there are corresponding uh, weed management strategies. So A through E over here uh, forms a kind of table of contents for that, um, the different uh, parts of the weed management guide, and that's available uh, free uh, through this link here as a PDF. Another important consideration is to use a diverse set of tools. So, yes, it's not all tools, but you certainly do want to use a different bunch of tools. And so, cultural strategies include. Uh, crop rotation and crop sequences, but are not limited to those, you know, also with different crop gene types and um, seed cleaning practices are important cultural tools. Um, you've got your chemical tools, many different physical tools, which were discussed here. I'll discuss a little bit seed predation and then also um, use of cover crops. So managing seed banks is something important to consider within your integrated weed management approach and in design of cropping systems. 
Uh, so these are seeds of uh, tall water hemp, and uh, they are quite persistent in the soil seed bank. So weed seeds can meet many different fates once they're dispersed. Um, before they even get into the soil seed bank, they might be washed somewhere else by wind and water. Uh, seeds that enter the seed bank, or before they get enter the seed bank, they might get eaten too. Those that enter the seed bank might germinate and live and then become part of that next uh, life cycle of weeds, or they might germinate and die in fatal germination. That could happen because they're too deep to live, or they might get attacked by a pathogen. Uh, seeds that don't germinate can remain dormant, which means that they're not active, but they're still alive, or they might lose viability and then just be dead, or the seed might decay. Each of those different fates is something that can potentially can be managed for. Or I mean, just take a quick drink. So one of the things about managing weed seeds is that they're so persistent that some folks have thought that it wasn't really worth um, managing them. So these earlier numbers produced by Burnside et al. showed that the half-life, the time for just 50% of the seed bank to go away in common lambs quarters was 12 years, eight years for velvet leaf, four years for smart weed and red weed pig weed two and a half years for common ragweed, less than a year for giant foxtail and kosher. With numbers like this, you know, it's very important. Clearly, you don't want them to be around that long. Your mistake could last a long time, but I also want to point out that those data were obtained through seeds that were stored in glass jars. And so that biased the data towards longevity we repeated this study and that we found we found much lower times for uh, half-lives for seed bank production. Rather than 12 years, looking at two years, uh, two and a half years for velvet leaf, half a year for smart weed, almost two years for red root pigweed, less than a year for common ragweed, a year for giant foxtail, very short for kochia. These were done with seeds that were being studied in the depth where seeds could actually germinate. So they were allowed to germinate, they were exposed to predators, exposed to decay, and uh, also fluctuating soil moisture. So this is more typical of what you might see in a real cropping system. And these are some of the decay curves for these data. And you can see that with the exception of velvet leaf, which kind of tapers off their, excuse me, most of these other ones are really decreasing quite quickly. So tillage can be a one-time rescue for a massive seed input, but I'll point out that a mold board plow, the turning action that it does is not just in one direction. And so this, um, these data that actually Chuck Moeller put together years ago show that for the moldboard plow, yes, most of them get put about six inches deep, a lesser amount at eight inches deep, but it also kicks some back up to the surface. <clears throat> uh, chisel plow, most of them go to the surface, some deeper. All these tools mix soil and seeds that you send down can actually come back up. So it's not a permanent fix. But if you have a particularly large seed rain that you want to get rid of, you can deal with that kind of one-time event by sending them down into deep storage. It also happens to be, though, that as you go further and further into the soil profile, the mortality factors for seeds get less and less. So one of the things about weed seeds is that they are germinating at the same time that the main crop is or if you, if you're producing seeds at the same time as the main crop is. And you can see this through um, combine clean out. So this was a tailings pile <clears throat> that I noticed 
uh, on the South Farms when I first began working at Illinois. And um, you can see velvet leaf and pigweed, um, barnyard grass, shatter cane. Combine is effectively capturing those seeds and dispersing them through the field. And Cousins and Crop st studied this spatially. Combine harvester can take these standing weeds with undispersed seed and spread them throughout the field. It's the most efficient, e efficient seed dispersal device ever invented. The Harrington Seed Destructor was developed by Ray Harrington in Australia back in the early 2000s. And uh, I worked with a group of folks who took it on to American farms. The way it works is that you plumb into the fines fraction of the combine, and the fines that include the weed seeds are plumbed right into a cage mill and destroyed. And then the straw, straw flow is separated and goes out the bottom of the combine. Here's a picture of what water hemp looks like when it passes through an HSD. You can see the seed coat completely ripped away. And in stationary trials, we saw the HSD reducing seed viability by more than 99%. When we took a look at the phenology of seed rain, we found that in most cases uh, for water hemp and cocklebird, two out of three years, we had seeds where almost you know, more than 95% were there for capture by the HSD. Uh, but not in all years. Um, in one year for cocklebur, uh, more, about half of the seed had dispersed by harvest time. When we took a look at the effect of that tool on seed return and in seedling growth the following year, we found that targeting that seed return uh, and could result in about a 70% reduction with the HSD, and then translating into about a 70% reduction in seedlings the following spring. So for the right crop, potentially including uh, harvest weed seed control as an option within your cropping system and your IWM strategy could be useful. But of course, if you're using a tool like the harvest, the Harrington Seed Destructor, um, you're going to begin pushing evolution as well. So you might select for weeds with earlier seed dispersal, or you might select for an earlier flowering time and earlier seed formation. You might select on seeds that were <clears throat> very large and too hard for the seed destructor to crush, or maybe even smaller and could slip through. Maybe higher seed coat strength or increased dormancy. Again, going back to that earlier example of herbicide resistance, all tools will break if they're overused and need to think about how to design cropping systems that use a bunch of strategies. So here I'll segue into a field study where we just did, did just that. So um, in this study, we were looking at cropping system diversification to build weed suppressive cropping systems. This was part of the Marsden Farm study. Uh, Matt Liebman, my mentor at Iowa State, uh, was the PI of this uh, study. And I had the good fortune to be in on the beginning and design of this. And so this is an aerial view where we're looking at the different rotations. So we've got three rotations, a two-year rotation with uh, maize and soybean, a three-year rotation with maize, soybean, oat, underseeded with red clover, and then a four-year rotation with maize, soybean, oat, underseeded with alfalfa, and then followed by another year of alfalfa. And so you can see what these various uh, treatments look like here. They were decent-sized plots. Um, they were... Uh, 24 rows wide by um, 200 feet long, so large enough that you can begin to use field scale equipment. So I'll just jump straight to uh, this radar plot 
which kind of compares all the different things going on in that study at once. So on the top part of this radar plot, we have things that you might want to see happen <clears throat> in the rotation. So um, these three lines, uh, the solid black line is the two-year rotation, the dashed line is the three-year rotation, and the gray line is the four-year rotation. We saw that profit was the same amongst the three systems. That actually overall harvested crop mass was greater in the three and four year rotations. Soybean yield was greater in the three and four year rotations. Maize yield was slightly higher in the three and four year rotations. But importantly for this particular crowd, weed seed bank depletion, which is a measure of long term weed management success, was the same for all three of these systems. So they were all succeeding equally well. The two-year rotation had a standard um, broadcast uh, er weed management uh, broadcast herbicide program. The three and four-year rotations were using banded herbicides on the row. What we see here on the bottom is that the amount of herbicide that was necessary in those three and four-year rotations was less than 20% less than a fifth of what was used in that two-year rotation. So other forms of weed management were filling in and compensating for that reduction in herbicide use there. We also saw lower freshwater toxicity in those ro uh, longer rotations compared to the two-year rotation. Interestingly, we saw a trade-off between energy use and labor so you did need, we were using cultivation as well as those banded um, herbicide applications in the three and four year rotations. There was a little bit more human labor, but quite a bit less embodied energy in the system. And if you're thinking about trying to you know, rebuild rural economies um, and having jobs for people in agriculture, then maybe uh, paying for additional labor or including additional labor in your system might be something to consider. So this is a look at the um, small grain phase with red clover underseeded underneath it. And one type of weed management benefit that was coming from that forage legume was allelopathy. And allelopathy is an effect that one organism has upon another by, mediated via by chemical. In this case, what was happening we were incorporating those green manures into the soil. That was creating an increase of phenolic acids in soil solution. And those phenolic acids were actually making weed seeds or in seedlings leakier and getting attacked by uh, fungi. Whereas the crop seeds, which were quite a bit larger, were not harmed. And down here you can see that the amount of inhibition that happened of seeds uh, decreased greatly as the seed got heavier. So crop seeds are generally, you know, 100 times heavier, or sometimes even more than 100 times heavier than those of the weeds that they, in, they're infested by. So in this case, allelopathy can actually form a selective uh, form of uh, chemical suppression that's not herbicidally based. Another thing that was featured in those longer rotations is that in addition to the forage legumes, um, the biological nitrogen fixation in those legumes, we were also using composted dairy manure in those systems. And one of the things about weeds is that they, many weeds are optimized as nutrient hogs, and they really like high fertility environments. Um, in this system, with a heavier influence uh, emphasis on organic sources of nitrogen, we had actually better synchrony between the availability of our um, nitrogen from our organic end source and nitrogen demand by the corn plants. Um, when you apply all of your nitrogen in a, a synthetic form 
it's there for the weeds to lap up quickly. And so we believe that was another form of weed suppression that we were obtaining in this system. Yet another form of suppression we were getting was through weed predation, seed predation. So these are um, empty giant foxtail seeds on the soil surface. They've all been eaten by seed predators. And um, seed predators can include many different organisms. Um, these are giant ragweed seeds being fed upon by small rodents and birds. Uh, other uh, critters include crickets and crabid beetles. Um, a single female cricket can actually eat about 200 common lamb quarter seeds in a day. And so providing a habitat for them in your cropping system can be important. Here's some work that we did looking at uh, just comparing wheat alone to a wheat plus red clover intercrop and found almost double the daily seed removal by weed seed predators. In that Marsden farm study, we were able to provide year-long habitat and cover to seed predators by having contrasting uh, crop growth periods. So corn and soybean canopy cover peaks in midsummer. When you've got a small grain and legume, you've got two main periods, your fall growth and then your spring growth. And then in summer, you've got a harvest and then some cuttings, so that reduces it, but then you've got your growth in the corn crop. And then in a forage legume like alfalfa, you've got growth followed by repeated cuts. But what you do have is across the growing season in these, with these contrasting phenologies of your crops and growth habits of your crops, you've got an opportunity for these uh, critters to have much more habitat available to them. Um, so in this figure, I'm showing that on moonlit nights, mice do get captured by owls. If they've got a uh, ground cover to call in, crawl in, they can continue eating. And in fact, we saw this signal of nocturnal illumination in predation rates in the Marsden farm study. Overall, when you take a look at the different tactics being used in the two-year rotation compared to the four-year diversified rotation, what you can see is that you end up having a much more diverse set of uh, stresses that are spread throughout the growing season. And that's consistent with the message I was saying earlier about um, wanting to make sure that you're not just focusing on killing you know, seedlings in April only, but that you're spreading your opportunities for weed control throughout the growing season. So I see that I'm running out of my time here. I'm gonna um, just go to this point and then the final um, slide in the presentation. When you're thinking about how you use tools in your system, in your integrated weed management system, think about herbicides or any other big hammer like cultivation as a way to tune rather than drive your weed management system and start with a weed, uh, weed suppressive cropping system. So I'm gonna shift to this last slide. Okay. So the most important weed management tool on your farm is your brain. And in order to get the thoughtful weed management, you need to consider a few things. First, you need to consider your weed community. So the biology of your dominant species, their spatial distribution on your farm and their population densities so that you can come up with appropriate management tactics. You also need to think about how those weeds are meet, defeating your current management system. Is it emergence timing like in that organic dairy example I showed you? Is it herbicide resistance? Is it just a huge seed bank? Or is it the way they compete with your crop? Notice which individual tools have an effect on weeds that are problems for you. And then think about how you can combine those tools and vary them over time so that they can be effective for years to come. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thanks very much for your attention.
That was very good. That was some uh, good new information for us. Do we have any questions? I'm not. I, I'm not sure if the uh, Palmer Amherst or Waterhouse are they air pollinated or insect pollinated? The amaranths, I believe, are uh, self pollinated by wind rather than wind. insects. Yeah. So yeah. Anybody okay. consider... Is that is that correct? Yeah, amaranth pollen can travel many kilometers. Is it? Is anybody using biology to create um, wheat plants and releasing that pollen back into the population? Yeah. In, in fact, um, my colleague Pat Trannell here at Illinois is working on male sterility in water hemp for precisely that reason. And there's a, um, a commercial outfit that'll then come crop dust your field with that male sterile pollen and basically flood the zone so that the female uh, stigmas are covered with the sterile pollen. So one, one thing that was not mentioned is that amaranth, the tall water have been the amaranth and amaranth have male and female plants. So the male flowers are in one plant and the female flowers are in Good point. Any other questions? Okay, thank you again, Dr. David. Yeah, you bet. And should I stick around for then the question and answer after this? Say that again. Should I stick around for the question and answer period after this? Well, um, does anyone have specific questions they want to discuss or?